All right, a very warm welcome to the fifth edition of the LSE Taxation Seminars 2023. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Hans Moich, chairs of the Tribute Organization. Hans, um, previously he was uh, a tax treaty negotiator for the Netherlands government, competent authority in tax treaty matters and delegate to the OECD working party number one, of the Model Tax Convention and members of its steering group. Hans also worked as consultant on tax treaty matters for the OECD, the United Nations and the IMF. Today, we will be discussing about a very crucial topic related to, to Pillar 2. It is entitled Resolution of, of tax, tax Disputes Under Pillar 2, the big question mark. We are, I am also delighted to, to introduce um, a panel of discussants who are LLM LSE students. They are Taisir Barakat from the from United Arab Emirates, Maria Bernarda Carpio from Ecuador, Matias Cunil from Chile, Parker Hassler from the United States of America, and finally Vasil Kuresa from Ukraine. Hans, a very warm welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you for your kind invitation to speak tonight. And thank you for your um, warm welcome and introduction. Um, in case, I mean, you would wonder what the Tribute Foundation is about, I can refer you to our website tribute-arbitration.org, like on the screen. And for any further questions, you can always refer to me via email at the email address indicated on this first slide. Now, well, my um, talk tonight actually is about dispute resolution on the pillar two, which I find puzzling. Um, I, I would like to start, let's say, with a few or general comments on Pillar 2 as a whole. Um, to be honest, I, I fail to understand what Pillar 2 actually um, means to achieve in the first place. And that's what my comments are about. I'm, I'm going to split my... Yes, probably here... Um, somewhat bigger now, hopefully. Um, now, I've, I've been wondering, I mean, there's, there's a lot, let's say, said about, let's say, what um, uh, Pillar 2 might mean. And I think one of the explanations I've been hearing is that um, the purpose would be, let's say, to make m and pay a fair share in each of the jurisdictions where they operate. Now, I think as a sort of follow-up to um, country by country reporting, that might be a logical step. However, if you look at the 15% effective tax rate that is proposed as a global minimum tax on the pillar two, that is really very, very low. I could would hardly call that a fair share. I mean, in most countries, both developed and developing countries, um, MMEs pay a lot more than 15%. Rates of 20 to 25% are much more common, and some countries go higher still. Um, if that 15% is to be the universal norm, then, and that's my concern, it may even be that those countries with higher rates come under pressure to reduce their rates to that level of 15%, reduce, right? Or as an alternative, face mass emigration of their m and to lower taxing jurisdictions, sort of corporate inversion, but then not to tax havens, but to entirely, let's say, legitimate um, uh, regimes. And in that way, the global minimum tax runs the risk of becoming a global 
maximum tax. An alternative claim that you often hear is that Pillar 2 would finally end all tax havens. Now, that is what tax, tax Pillar 2 certainly does, but it does a lot more than that, unfortunately. It hurts basically any concessional tax regime indiscriminately, including the ones that are based on honest considerations, which support entirely genuine economic activities. And I mean, the bizarre, the bizarre situation may occur that a concessional regime that has the approval of the OECD for among harmful tax practices may at the same time, despite that approval, become liable to top up tax on the pillar two. Now, apparently the United States is demanding express confirmation that it's green subsidies. These are these refundable tax credits under the US Inflation Reduction Act will not suffer other countries stop up tax. That, that, that would be the punch in the nose of the US. Some people in the US call it that way. Now, I mean, that kind of confirmation is something I'm pretty sure many other countries would like to have as well in respect of their concessional tax regimes. Um, my question actually is why, why not rely? Why not simply rely on the examination by the OCD Global Forum, which is much more profound and considers both motives, but also effects of regimes? Wouldn't that be much simpler and effective? Now, thirdly, it has even been suggested that the sole purpose of Pillar 2 would be to help the US government appease resistance from US MEs against its own proposed domestic tax, domestic minimum tax, a so called guilty, very strange, very strange name. <laughs> guilty, the global intangible low tax income, that, that, is, that is what it's about. So the idea is that the US government could then say to US m and look guys, you won't have it any better than with us. Okay, that's understandable. But why? That's my question then. Why would the rest of the world want to appease the United States? Well, for instance, country may agree with Pillar 2 in exchange for Pillar 1, the digital services tax, which is then their true priority. I'm, I'm pretty sure that goes for many, many countries. Um, the OECD actually sells the two pillars as one package deal. So if you want to have Pillar 1, digital services tax, you have to accept Pillar 2 as well. Um, the US government actually puts in extra weight by threatening to retaliate any countries that dare tax beyond Pillar 1, which I'm pretty sure to date a large number of countries in the world are thinking of. Um, further, on the positive side, the OECD tries to lure countries into supporting Pillar 2 by suggesting an enormous extra revenue gain. Um, and the OECD mentions, I mean, some 220 billion euros, which is a really a stunning amount of revenue. Now, I mean, that can only hold if there are many low taxing countries refusing to raise their taxes up to the level of the global minimum tax, right? But at the same time, the OECD claims that in its inclusive framework, there would be sort of general consensus, a general agreement with Pillar 2. Now these two, I think, enormous revenue gain, and on the other hand, let's say sort of global consent, I think very, I find very difficult to match, to be honest. And I mean, you would actually start to wonder what, what does the OCD actually expect from Pillar 2? Is it 
compliance with the global minimum tax, or is it that extra revenue? What is it? Now, it is this confusion, this ambiguity, I would call it, about the aims of Pillar 2 that spills over to the issue of dispute resolution as well. That is at least how I see it. Um, I hope I can now, uh, yes, return to the screens. Indeed, here we are. Now, this is, I mean, a little bit of the index of the kind of issues that I want to address tonight. So my first question, my first issue is, why doesn't Pillar 2 provide for any instruments for dispute resolution or dispute prevention? I think that is that is very striking. The other, and that's sort of logical follow-up question, is there actually any scope for disputes under Pillar 2, right? If there's no scope, you don't have to provide any instruments. Um, if there is scope, I mean, then we'll have to do with the existing instruments, and it's basically with map the mutual agreement procedure at a treaty level. So that's the question, which inst existing instruments are then available and can they provide an effective means for prevention or resolution of disputes? And if they can't provide an effective means, and that's issue number four, which improvements should then be made to make them effective? Now, as said, I think the striking thing is that Pillar 2 does not provide for any instruments for dispute resolution or dispute prevention. And it's striking because Pillar 1 does. Pillar 1 has its well, novelties of panels for joint review and mandatory binding determination. These are novelties and the novelties to be cheered at. But I think if there are this kind of explicit instruments under pillar one, then why are there none under pillar two? Policy-wise, in any case, this is really a major inconsistency and also a painful one. But I, because I would think that if you are committed to proper dispute resolution, as the OECD claims it is, and I think has shown to be over the past years, then I would think that you must include proper dispute resolution in every rule that you propose. That is a matter of principle. You can't bargain with that, right? And, and, and not, let's say, for instance, to cover up a sort of conflict of interest as they may be among your membership. Um, it has been suggested, for instance, that the United States, which has most of the interest of Pillar 1, has the big tech to protect against digital services taxes in other countries. And that's why the US would have an interest in proper dispute resolution under Pillar 1. But under Pillar 2, I mean, you see, <laughs> you would see a reversal of interest. I think their countries like the United States, but also the EU have an interest, let's say, on applying pop-up tax without any interference from, well, um, uh, uh, dispute resolution panels or arbitrators or whatever. But I think that is just a speculation on, uh, on my part. Now, speculation indeed. Um, what other reasons might we think of why there is no provision for dispute resolution or prevention under Pillar 2? Now, some people have suggested, well, I think most those countries um, will probably raise 
their effective tax rate up to the 15% of the global minimum tax. And so you wouldn't really have any disputes. Everyone will comply. But then I think the question is, um, what is the basis for that kind of assumption? Would countries be willing to do that? And also, can they actually do that? Are they in the position to do that? Now, first of all, I think we should remember that tax concessions are not all bad, right? There is this, let's say, this sort of discussion going on within the developing world and also propelled by NGOs that countries, developing countries should get rid of all their tax expenditures. This is a major discussion. But um, uh, tax expenditures, tax concessions may be effective, right? And in that way may be legitimate to get rid of the non-effective tax concessions, which do not really attract genuine foreign direct investment Okay, that's understandable, that is advisable. But there are tax concessions around that actually are effective in attracting genuine foreign tax, uh, foreign direct investment. And why should a country give that kind of concessions up? So that is that is question, question. I, I think countries having those kind of really effective tax concessions would be very reluctant to abandon that, despite penalty threats. Now, second, I think, um, uh, consideration is that countries may actually be bound under private arrangements with investors to give those concessions. I mean, there are many countries in, uh, in, uh, around the world, in Latin America, in Africa, to some extent also in Asia that have concluded so-called taxability clauses um, uh, uh, under certain private contracts uh, with private investors, for instance, with mining concessions. That's, that's quite an ordinary feature. And I think that would be very, very difficult for those countries to simply say, look, now we have PIDA 2 and we have to apply an effective tax rate at a minimum of 15%, and sorry, bias, <laughs> we have to ignore that taxability clause. I don't think that's possible. Um, there are, uh, some institutions have argued, well, I mean, then those clauses should be renegotiated. Well, I can tell you from, <laughs> from my own personal experience, that would be very, very difficult. I think negotiating those clauses also within, let's say, the more general framework of those concessional contracts is very, very difficult. So if not impossible at all. Now, another reason to assume that there might not be much scope for disputes is, <laughs> that there will not be many countries act to actually apply top-up tax, right? So the other side of the coin. <laughs> um, but first of all, it has to be pointed out that Pillar 2 does not envisage any multilateral treaty. So uh, there is no multilateral convention um, uh, uh, imposing any obligation on countries to apply a top-up tax. They can decide for themselves whether they want to do so or not, whether they want to implement uh, Pillar 2 in their domestic law or not. It's entirely up to each country individually to decide that. Um, so far, I mean, there have been a number of countries indicating that they, well, that they agree with Pillar 2 and we'll be looking into actual implementation. I think Korea, I think, was the first. Singapore is another one, the European Union. Um, although <laughs> when it comes to the European Union, I can add that I think there is agreement. There is even, let's say, a sort of official agreement by way of a European directive on Pena 2. 
but the actual implementation is entirely left to the EU member states. And so far, no EU member state have indicated how, to what extent, they believe they um, must or can implement Pillar 2 in their domestic law. That's a big, that is indeed a very big question mark. And what I've been hearing from a number of um, uh, 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 governmental officials in Europe, that they are really wrestling with the question what they should do or what they could do. Many countries um, have already, let's see, FC law in place, which I think covers most of what Pena to envisage. So um, a parent company situated in their jurisdiction with um, activities and profits stored away in a low taxing jurisdiction, a tax haven might be taxed for that stored profits under CFC law, right? Now, if you have that type of law, then what more could you possibly do to implement Pillar 2? That's really a question. Now, I think CFC law does not apply to um, uh, relations between sister companies, right? It's only between parent and a daughter or granddaughter company. So there's a limitation on CFC, what you can do, let's say, to implement Pillar 2. Um, making adjustments to transfer prices with other entities within an m and &E, I think that is also limited, right, under <laughs> transfer pricing guidelines, which are often also implemented into domestic law. I mean, you can't simply, let's say, correct a price if there is not, let's say, sufficient reason within the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. I mean, that would be a violation of the guidelines, right? <laughs> so there's another limitation. Um, if you would have, let's say, deductions of payments within an m and &E, um, well, I mean, <laughs> You might subject that, let's say, to a limitation on that, de on that deduction. Like, for instance, you have deduction limitations on interest. That would be an example. So countries might have, let's say, somewhat more flexibility in that respect. But then I think if you would have a very serious difference between, let's say, what you allow as a deduction domestically uh, versus internationally in respect to jurisdictions with a low effective tax rate, then I think you might um, become uh, liable to all kinds of accusations that you are discriminating. All right, so I think there's a threshold, there's a limitation um, uh, to, to applying that kind of lim uh, 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 um, deduction limitation on deductions as well. You can't do that, let's say, um, uh, endlessly. So, yeah, I think that is, are going, countries going to raise their effective tax rate? Are countries going to apply top-up tax? It's all very, very uncertain. Um, Well, as said, I think it, the whether whether Pillar Two is going to be implemented in domestic law and how it's going to be implemented is entirely at the discretion of individual countries, absent a multilateral convention. And I think the major complaint about scope for dispute comes logically from MNEs. MNEs have the obligation to file um, 
uh, pop-up tax reports. So MNEs have the obligation under Part 2 to calculate if they should pay any top-up tax and report that to relevant jurisdictions, whether it's a sole state or the state of the parent company or state of subsidiary companies. It's the obligation of MNEs, and it's very logical that MNEs are very, very concerned that the interpretation and application of Pillar 2 would be very different among um, uh, the jurisdictions where they have their presence. Um, and we've seen, let's say, a similar um, uh, concern also reflected in an OECD public discussion document of December last year. And indeed, there is a lot of scope for differences in interpretation and application, because I think the, if you first look, let's say, at the rules of Pellet, Pellet 2 for the computation of the effective tax rate and the allocation of top-up taxes between various jurisdictions where an M&E has a presence, I think that is, these are really complex rules and difficult to grasp and definitely um, uh, fit for different interpretations. Um, there are also very complex rules on the pillar two on um, uh, which kind of taxes are covered by pillar two. Excluded entities, entities that are excluded from the application of pillar two like pension funds, etc. Certain types of income which are excluded from the application of Pillar 2. I mean, these are really vague notions and very much, let's say, liable to different interpretations. So I think there's definitely a lot of reasons for MEs to be concerned about this and to be um, and to complain and demand, let's say, more certainty in this respect. But it's not just, let's say, MEs that might have a difficulty that could run into a dispute. Um, and the disputes may not just, let's say, be about factual issues like application or interpretation of rules or the determination of um, amounts. There also, there's also scope for more principled um, disputes. Um, and let me, let's say, outline a number of those possible disputed issues. Um, some of these issues are purely domestic. Others uh, and, and, and may um, come up, let's say, in domestic court cases, but others might, let's say, uh, might be domestic, but also international at tax treaty level. And the two might definitely even concur at the same time. Now, number one, I think that, that, that we have to identify is, well, the country's domestic jurisdiction to apply top-up tax. As said, I think countries may not have, apart from CFC law, may not have, let's say, much possibility for, um, for applying top-up tax at the risk of becoming, let's say, extraterritorial. In their, um, in their taxation of violating international public law. This is definitely, this is at currently, I think, really a major dispute in, uh, in the United States. Um, and um, I mean, no one knows, I think that there is, there is a sort of expectation that at some point in time, the OECD will come up with a statement in this respect, but who's the OECD <laughs> to, uh, to come up with, let's say, legitimate and binding conclusions in this respect? No, and you, only domestic courts can rule on this. Another issue with can, it may come up in both domestic court and also international in, uh, in, uh, in MAP, is on the compatibility of top of taxes with tax treaties, in particular Article 7. Article 7 allows a country to tax profits arising in another country only 
if a company has a permanent establishment there. But I think for the top up taxes, it doesn't matter whether there's a, <laughs> a permanent establishment or not. So there might be actually a violation of Article 7 of tax treaties. Now, this is a discussion we had before in respect of the application of CFC law. And there the OECD um, uh, decided that application of CFC law is not a violation of Article 7. It is allowed, not because it's CFC law, be, because I think it's, it's a measure that strikes down tax avoidance, right? And I mean, that fits within a sort of general statement the OECD has made, in which we see reflected also in the OECD commentaries, that domestic anti-abuse or anti-avoidance rules are legitimate, are applicable without any limitations under tax treaties, right? But then of course the question comes, is pillar two an anti-avoidance rule? Well, <laughs> that's what I just discussed. I think that is not really clear if it's an anti-avoidance rule. So that may actually be quite a serious issue for disputes both domestically and internationally. Now, there are countries that have a statute on treaty override. The US has one, Germany has one, uh, to the effect that, let's say, a later domestic law can override a tax treaty. So, I mean, these countries, US and Germany, and probably a few others as well, might argue, well, we have implemented pillar, to, pillar two in our domestic law. And because the domestic law is later than all of our tax treaties, I mean, we are permitted to apply pillar two by way of a treaty override. But then I think the entire concept of treaty override is not, let's say, globally accepted as a legitimate practice. I think apart from those few countries that apply treaty override in their constitution, I think, I think the, the majority of, country, of other countries will definitely, let's say, decline treaty override and will resist it in an international dispute. Um, apart from domestic and uh, tax treaty disputes, I think we also should consider disputes under bilateral investment treaties, uh, because the argument might be that let's an application of pillar two, pillar two, a pop-up tax, may violate the fair and equitable treatment standard under bids, right? Um, uh, similarly, let's say the um, uh, uh, tax stability clauses, which I um, uh, referred to priorly. So I think we have a source country applying uh, a sort of top, ta up, top up tax to increase its effective tax rate up to that minimum of 15%. Well, I mean, that made my, made my quite a difference for an investor and um, uh, very seriously, let's say, diminishes uh, the profitability of its investment. So I think there is definitely concern for disputes also on the bids in, the, in that account. Um, similarly, there may also be um, uh, discussions within Europe on the compatibility with EU law, in particular the freedom of establishment. There are various commentators, very serious and learned experts have already pointed out that this is very dubious whether a top-up tax might be compatible with the freedom of establishment because the freedom of establishment makes it clear let's say that the level of taxation in the country where the investment takes place simply should be respected. 
And then, of course, that is not what top up tax does. We might also see, we might even see problems with international trade rules. You may remember that in the past, um, there have been uh, uh, arbitration before the World Trade Organization on the US Foreign Sales Corporation rule, right? Which was stricken down by the World Trade Organization as a illegitimate, illegitimate um, practice um, uh, 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 and in conflict with uh, uh, the, the fair trade. So even that might be possible. Now, in that particular public discussion um, document of December two, 2022, the OECD, while not, let's say, providing for um, uh, dispute resolution rules itself, made some recommendations how to resolve or prevent possible disputes. And I think the first priority of the OECD, according to that document, is to give technical guidance through the inclusive framework, basically to establish a harmonization in the way the various countries implement Pillar 2 into their domestic law. So it's harmonization. Um, and in fact, I think very recently in a document of February 2nd, such technical guidance and very detailed technical guidance was provided. Now, I think all fair, but I think the big question of course is how binding the technical guidance is. I mean, the inclusive framework itself it's just, let's say, a sort of informal platform. There is no binding effect or commitment whatsoever. I mean, participating countries sit there and listen. Sometimes they say <laughs> something. Most of the time they are simply silent and listen to what the OECD says or explains. And then, of course, they drink a glass and... <laughs> subsequently each go their own separate ways. So what is the binding effect of, uh, probably not, I think so, probably not. Like Pena 2 not having any binding effect, this type of technical guidance doesn't have any binding effect, just the same. Um, another suggestion that the OCD made, in particular for the MNEs, is to explore international APAs and joint audits and ICAP, let's say the, 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 um, uh, uh, the international um, uh, assurance program as a means, let's say, to prevent disputes, to get that certainty from all the, the, um, uh, the uh, relevant countries at the same time. Um, uh, uh, the point, however, is that I think these instruments are still in their infancy. Now, an in international APA, <laughs> there are not many. Very recently, the OECD issued some kind of guidance how to establish that. But an international APA, in particular, if it's a multilateral APA, takes a hell of a time. Five years, well, mostly more than five years. They're also very costly for all countries participating and for the m and &E in particular, because of, I mean, enormous amount of information that has to be provided. Um, joint audits and ICAP have the same problem. They're extremely time consuming and costly. And joint audits and ICAP in particular have an additional problem that they do not provide any tax certainty to m &E's, basically because the outcome is not binding on tax authorities. <laughs> so the reason, I mean, what you see in practice is that, I mean, these instruments are not much sought after at present. 
So <laughs> the suggestion to m and well, try those. I mean, that's, that's I, you can't, not really, let's say, considered a very serious suggestion. Um, you would definitely not, let's say, advise m and to follow domestic adjudication if it deals with an international dispute, because I think we all know the problem with domestic uh, adjudication. I think it only binds one country, right? All the other jurisdictions involved are not bind. I mean, and, and to have, let's say, all kinds of domestic disputes in, in all the countries, the jurisdictions where an m &E has a presence and then having outcomes which differ. That, of course, is not a realistic suggestion. So it should come from an international solution. And the only instrument that we have to date for that purpose is MAP, right? The Mutual Agreement Procedure. Now, what we see generally, and I, I will, let's say, um, uh, uh, elaborate on that further on in my presentation, what we see generally is that MAP is about amicable settlement. It's not really about a resolution. It is about settlement of disputes. But if you have a very a truly principled disputes, like, for instance, on the application of Article 7, right? where one country says, well, top-up tax is a violation of Article 7, and the other country said, it is not a violation. I mean, how could you possibly settle that kind of dispute? You could only, let's say, resolve that through arbitration. But I think then, I mean, the commitment of countries to map arbitration presently is very, very low. I think and when the MLI was concluded, the MLI, you know, has a option for mandatory binding tax treaty arbitration. I think there were some 40 countries committing to that. But ever since that number of 40 countries has hardly grown. So that commitment, I think, is still very, very low. So these, these principal disputes are likely to, main, to remain unresolved in, uh, in MAP. Now, what m and might do is to turn to bit arbitration, right? To give, let's say, the fair and equitable treatment standard on the bits a very wide interpretation and see if uh, bit arbitrators are receptive to that. I think that's what we've been seeing over the past few years, that more and more tax treaty issues end up in bit arbitration, right? Rightly or wrongly. But I think if that's the only possibility m have to obtain a binding resolution, they will explore that. Similarly, states might go to um, World Trade Organization arbitration if they feel they are wronged by another country. So these are, in particular, those two latter uh, possibilities, bit arbitration and WTO arbitration, are not considered at all by the OECD yet. I think there is still as a really a very serious possibility in my view. Now, the dispute situation of pillar two is something I think I find is exemplary for tax treaty dispute resolution generally, right? This is not, let's say, an incident. I think the entire situation of dispute resolution under tax treaties is still very, yeah, I think very tricky, very immature. I think despite, let's say, um, a lot of effort that the OECD has put into, let's say, improving uh, the mutual agreement procedure over the past few years, I think it still, let's say, remains um, a sort of, well, not very satisfactory situation. Um, and let me, let me outline, let's say, what is most needed? What, is, what are the biggest failures, in my view? 
I think, first of all, what um, fails is a sort of informal and easily accessible and quick coordination mechanism at an early order to taxpayer level, basically to resolve what I call the unnecessary disputes, disputes that are um, uh, uh, based on misinformation or misunderstanding of rules or of factual circumstances. These are definitely unnecessary disputes. And if there would be, let's say, a better coordination between auditors of different countries, between auditors and taxpayers, if the auditors and the taxpayers could simply pick up the phone, right? A conference call, <laughs> have direct contact and discuss, I think, what is the situation? How should the information be understood, right? How do we all apply the rules? How do we all understand the rules? I think that might resolve a lot. But today, this kind of coordination mechanism doesn't exist. It is, I think, forbidden because the authority to reach agreement at order to level it doesn't exist. I think only competent authorities in MAP have the authority to conclude this kind of agreements. <laughs> so there's a, yes, this is definitely a big failure. I think the, 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 the joint review um, uh, panels that are now proposed under pillar one might actually be a start for this type of mechanism. But I think whether this, proposal of pillar one will actually take shape. I think that's very, very insecure. Now, another very big failure in my view is um, uh, there is hardly any use made of third party technical advice and mediation, both at domestic level and certainly not in mutual agreement procedures. Now, what we often see is that parties, authorities and taxpayers, but also authorities of different countries simply talk past each other. They send, but do not receive. They more or less speak different languages, sometimes even literally. And I think to improve this kind of relations, you really need to have, let's say, independent and reliable experts that can guide the parties into, let's say, proper available resolutions. Um, it's typically that the UN commentaries mention the possibility of third party technical advice, right? Um, uh, and very recently, there has, been, there has even been discussion within the UN Tax Committee to include a special clause on mediation into the UN Model Tax Convention, which many countries considered um, uh, uh, not only wishable, but also necessary because they argued that they would need such kind of express provision to have the proper authority to turn to mediation. Now, in the discussions at the UN Tax Committee, while I think the developing countries generally were very much in favor, it were the OCD countries that blocked the proposal, right? So the OCD countries blocked the proposal. And the argument apparently was that adopting mediation might undercut the OECD effort for arbitration. <laughs> yes, well, but since, I mean, so few countries commit to arbitration and many more countries would be happy to embrace mediation, it might be wiser, let's say, to turn to mediation first instead of placing all your money, all your bets on arbitration. That, at least, that's what I would think. Now, a third big failure and I think that is somewhat more, let's say, um, uh, uh, futuristic, 
is that I'd say there is simply no systematic testing of tax treaty rules on their controversiality, whether they are prone to raise disputes. Neither, I think, are they tested on, let's say, for instance, compliance burden, compliance costs for both authorities and taxpayers. And that's very strange, because if we talk about domestic laws, many, many countries have, let's say, very explicit programs to test new rules, domestic rules, whether they are easy to apply, whether um, they're understandable, whether or not too costly, et cetera. But when it comes to tax treaty rules, no such tests exist. So I think, well, while tax treaty rules um, are, are definitely uh, a, a, a main source of controversies and to the effect that the sense that they are very fact sensitive and also multi-interpretable. I think there, this kind of tests should be considered, I think, by both the OECD and the UN. So before proposing new rules or testing the existing models, come up with a new update, I think this kind of test should definitely apply. Now, it's clear that these kind of tests were never uh, applied to pillar two. I think pillar two is, let's say, the, I mean, probably the ultimate example of a rule which is prone to raise controversies entirely different, depending on factual determinations and, uh, and, and giving way to enormous and various multi uh, uh, interpretations. So pillar two would definitely fail this type of test. Um, additionally, I would argue that the OECD should abandon its sort of exclusive trust in the success of MAP, right? I think the OECD, as said, has put a lot of effort into improving MAP, into making countries open up MAP programs, come up with regulations, uh, install um, a competent authority capacity. But if we look at the effect there, then I think it's quite questionable. So I've copied, let's say, this diagram from the recent, most recent OECD map statistics of November last year. So these are, let's say, map cases closed in, um, uh, OCD member jurisdictions and a number of third countries that have committed to uh, provide statistics and cases closed in 2021. So, and what we see, now I use my pointer, my laser pointer, what we see here in, uh, in this purple um, uh, element, 53% of map cases closed, were closed with a full agreement between the disputing countries. Only, I would say only 53. So 47% did not, of the map cases did not provide, let's say a full or did uh, solution or did not provide any solution whatsoever. So, I mean, you can argue, is the glass half full or is it half empty? <laughs> but I think if you, would, if you would really claim that MAP is a success, that 57 should be <laughs> nearly 100%, right? Much more. Now, what happens, let's say, with the remaining part? So we have here 12% was resolved by countries giving a unilateral relief for foreign tax. 10%, the light green, that was some kind of other domestic remedy provided. So I think, imagine the case, there is a tax treaty, which gives all kinds of provisions for relief of double taxation. And nonetheless, one country, has to provide unilateral relief to meet, let's say, the problem of a taxpayer. 
right? This is what is called in, in terms of strategy of map negotiations, the beggar thy neighbor strategy. So in map negotiation, one country simply doesn't move at all and gambles that at the end of the day, the other country, although not obliged to do that, simply gives a unilateral solution at its own cost, right, to accommodate the taxpayer, right? That's beggar thy neighbor. Now, I think a third major component <laughs> is, I say, here's some 9% of cases are simply withdrawn by the taxpayer. Always say it's out of despair, right? The taxpayers, oh, this is never going to become any success. So after years of fruitless map negotiation, waiting and waiting and waiting, the taxpayer withdraw the cases. Now, my analysis is that those 52% of cases that did provide, let's say, a full solution are mostly transfer pricing cases, are factual cases are about, well, I would even say unnecessary disputes, right? Disputes that are fairly easy to tackle for competent authorities that might actually be tackled at an earlier, at a lower auditor level. So those cases, um, at least a large portion of that, should not have ended in MAP at all, right? On the other hand, all those unresolved or only partial resolved cases very often are um, uh, cases where the disputes is about interpretation, right? Principled disputes, right? Where there's so simply not an in-between. It's either one position or the other, but there's so not sort of in-between option possible. Or, the cases deal with very large revenue interest, and for that reason could not be settled in MAP. Now, these are typically cases that can only be resolved by arbitration, right? That is my conclusion. However, that is not the conclusion that you will find in the OECD statistics. What the OECD says, in the inclusive framework is when it advocates arbitration or some kind of mandatory binding instrument like on the pillar wall, is that developing countries, you don't have to be afraid to accept it because you can trust this. You never actually have to go to arbitration, right? Why not? Well, <laughs> that is because you are understood to settle in math, right? But then I think there's a big problem for developing countries when conducting a map. And that is what I call the power imbalance. Dealing with map with developed countries usually is dealing with an administration that has much more capacity, much more expertise, that can simply overpower a developing country, right? That's what happens. The developed countries may argue, and actually that is known from practice, that happens quite a lot. They will argue against developing countries, your position is no good. You don't know it, we know it. You don't know it because you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the expertise. We have, and we say that your position is entirely Flawed, so you better give up. Now, the only way for the developing country to have, let's say, their position tested in a neutral and expert way is arbitration, right? Now, for me, this is the big mystery. Arbitration would be a blessing to many developing countries for exactly this reason of the power imbalances. Nonetheless, I think many, many developing countries still maintain their sort of principled opposition against arbitration. Now, why is that? Why is that? Now, in the past, 
I think in the past there was, um, uh, yes, we're now here at this particular last section. In the past, you often hear it's about sovereignty, right? Rendering ourselves to um, arbitration by third party is in conflict with our country's sovereignty and may actually raise constitutional problems. Um, in some cases, I think this is a genuine reservation, but I think the, the <laughs> some examinations show that actually this was not a true, a genuine problem. The true problem was entirely different. That was, let's say, lack of experience with arbitration, a lack of transparency of the arbitration process, and likewise, a lack of trust. Who would be the arbitrators? Would they have, let's say, a understanding of the specific problems of developing countries, right? Now, the kind of map arbitrations we had so far were mostly between the United States and Canada and within Europe. None of those arbitrations, there have been, none of the arbitrations were ever published. So even if a country would be interested in committed to arbitration, it would have no, let's say, experience published which it could take account of, right? Which to take into consideration. No publication on what kind of type of arbitration there was applied, what rules were applicable, who were the arbitrators, how were the arbitrators selected? Well, if countries that are committed to arbitration and actually apply arbitration remain addicted to non-publication, how could then they ever succeed in making other countries enthusiastic, warm up for arbitration? I think that's an improbability. So we definitely need to have much more transparency in publication in this respect. Is there any improvement to be expected? Well, Actually, there is an interesting initiative in 2019 to, re to report from a group of EU member countries that had done a sort of project. Um, uh, and I mean, in the EU, there is a directive for tax treaty arbitration, which provides for an extremely elaborate uh, procedure which called reason, which called reasoned opinion arbitration, um, which is so complicated. I, I won't elaborate too much on the procedure here. I will only say this is so complicated and time consuming that no one actually wants to go there. But the directive, interesting enough, also provides for a much shorter procedure based on what they call the baseball arbitration which is practiced, as we know, in particular by the United States and Canada. And this group of countries have now, let's say, drafted a report um, uh, uh, on the possibility to have this type of baseball arbitration applied by a permanent, a permanent um, platform, right? And so, and their uh, suggestion is to have the permanent court of arbitration at the Peace Palace in The Hague, which is a sort of UN-ish organization, apply that baseball arbitration, not just, let's say, for disputes internally in Europe, but also, and probably even more importantly, for disputes between European countries and non-European countries with the focus Primarily, I think, on the United States, because that's where most of the problems are located. Hans, can you hear me? Yes. Could, could you please um, complete your presentation in two minutes? 
I'm about to finish. I'm already at the end. Fantastic. Thank you. And so that is really, I think, an interesting um, uh, initiative, which I think definitely is worthwhile for other countries um, uh, already committed to, um, to tax treaty arbitration to take note of and to engage in discussion with these European uh, countries and see what can be achieved here. Um, I think this is, would definitely, let's say, satisfy a demand for arbitration, which is quick, right? Which is not very costly, which is transparent. And I think which can provide for, let's say, um, reliable tax arbitrators with diversity, right? Not just experts from the developed countries, but from all of the world. Um, a very inclusive and diverse crowd. So this is something I think worthwhile to look into and to further explore. Preferably, at least in my view, under the UN umbrella, as the Permanent Court of Arbitration also is. So that's it. That's it, uh, uh, what I'm concerned, Eduardo. In, I'm very open for, um, for comments of the debaters. Hans, thank you so much for such thought-provoking, deep presentation of the fundamental issues emerging from Pillar 2 in the area of, of the field resolution. Now, um, I suggest proceeding as follows. I will invite the discussants. They are coming from three different continents. I will invite each of them to present their views in between two and three minutes each, um, fundamentally focusing on your questions that are listed on slide two. So Hans, may I ask you to go to slide two where your fundamental questions are located? So um, I think we may need a, a female insight on these. So I would like to, to invite first uh, Maria Bernarda Carpio from Ecuador to offer your views, potential responses to these questions in between two and three minutes. Maria Bernarda, over to you. Hi, hi Eduardo, thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, Hans, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very thought provoking. And as a person coming from a developing country, I really like your, your closure about arbitration as a blessing to developed countries. But besides that, uh, in focusing on these questions, my comments and also question to you, because I would like, like to know also your insights about this, is related to the second and the first question. Because uh, as I can see, it seems to me that um, regarding the second question, there is not, not there is now something new on pillar two, because for me, all these possible disputes that might arise from pillar two, are related to um, two common um, issues already present in the tax uh, international arena, that would be a domestic law overriding treaty, treaty law, and also the problem of double taxation. So taking into consideration that maybe those will be the, the major topics on these disputes, I think that that might be the reason why Pillar 2 do not provide an instrument for dispute resolution in contrast with Pillar 1, because for me, Pillar 1 is really introducing a new structure by adding a new player in, in a new jurisdiction with rights to, to tax, whereas what Pillar 2 is doing is um, inviting countries to implement a local a domestic legislation. And in doing so, the main problem would be in what extent this domestic legislation is really overriding Treaty law, and in what station by in what sorry in what extension by applying this domestic law, uh, some double taxation scenarios may arise. And to those for those uh, problems, there are already some uh, instruments to to tackle these tax disputes. And even if those instruments are not um, as effect, as effective effective sorry as they can be, um, there's no need to any new instrument itself. So. That, that is um, my view in the two-fold question, and I would like to, to know uh, Hans' insight about this. 
Thank you very much, Maria Bernarda. Now let's move from, from South America to, to Europe. Vasil Cureza, over to you. Uh, thank you, Eduard. And also want to say thank you, Mr. Hans, for this presentation. It was really interesting and indeed mind provoking, and especially for me, for I am uh, going to write a dissertation regarding Pillar 2, and I found a lot of insights from your presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to share with you my general uh, opinion about the Pillar 2. I see this tension that this the initiative creates between the tax hubs, multinationals, developing and developed countries. And I assume that this resolution mechanism would be would play a fundamental role in effective implementation of this initiative. And given all these problems that you rose, raised during your presentation, I just wanted to ask you a general question. Do you think that this initiative has future or is just, uh, as you said, a margin tool uh, uh, between, for implementation of pillar one and pillar two between different countries, between the United States and other countries? This is my first uh, question. And the second question is that while looking into the uh, topic before your presentation, the first thing that came to my mind about the dispute resolution was uh, BAT as well, because I understand that investors that are subject to Pillar 2 are the most powerful investors in every jurisdiction. And especially in mining industry, as you mentioned, they are very precise with respect to the guarantees that the state provide them when they want to invest this money. And I understand that they may search for different tools to protect their right. And BAT, I think, is one of the most effective tools for them. And in this regard, I just wanted to add that I think in the European Union, maybe I just wanted to hear a thought about it. Given that Pillar 2 initiative would be introduced by or is introduced by the respective directive, maybe it would be easier for European countries and member states and taxpayers to apply for the ECJ tax rulings or uh, um, some clarifications with respect to application of these rules. So th this is my three questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vasil. Now let's go back to South America. Matthias Kunil, over to you, please. Matthias, are you there? So, sorry, I was I was mute. Yes. Now, just just to start with the uh, to thank Hans for 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 the the presentation it was really interesting to think about it. I was all all the week and think about some ideas to share with you today, and <clears throat> and I, and I would love to 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 focus on the first question, um, because the way I see this is that the implementation of the pillar two could potentially impact the concept of national sovereignty in tax policy in a few different ways. And firstly, of course, the imposition of, of a global minimum tax uh, could be seen as, a, as an infringement on a country's ability to set out uh, its own policy and determine in its own tax rate. Although, as you mentioned, there is no a multilateral agreement in this, and they they have to to agree on applying Pillar Two, and and secondly, and, and most focus on on the the tax dispute resolution arena, the, the 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 lack of 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 prevention mechanisms in 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 tax resolution disputes. Uh, could be seen for this as for these countries as they don't don't know, don't have the the right to recourse if they believe that the implementation of the pillar two is not in their interest. So I, I would like to, to to question to to raise this question: how how might implementing pillar two impact the concept of national sovereignty in tax policy? Particularly given the potential for the, the 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 global minimum tax to become de facto a maximum tax across all jurisdictions, that's I would love to 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 discuss here. Thank today. you, thank you very much, Matthias, for that. And now let's move on, move to North America. Parker Hasler from the U.S. Parker, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Eduardo. And, and thank you, Hans, for the presentation. Um, I think it was really helpful, especially in kind of unpacking um, some of the issues surrounding Pillar 2. Uh, the thing that I just wanted to focus on has to do with some of the issues with confidentiality and arbitration. Um, and to what extent, assuming that there were no longer confidentiality, whether or not these sort of binding arbitration should have precedential effect or not on future arbitrations um, and sort of what role that might play. And I think my second question would be, um, I, I really appreciated your comment about developing countries and that you know this may actually be beneficial to them um, and having these arbitration proceedings. But I was wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit more about to what extent um, having an arbitration may help with power imbalances that may um, exist absent. Um, you know, just with a MAP procedure, it seems like the power imbalance, I see the, the point that you've made about um, that assisting these people um, you know, in developing countries, but I was also curious whether or not there's also the possibility that superior counsel um, with more funds in some of these countries may, may still leave a power imbalance even with arbitration. Thank you very much, Parker, for that. And then uh, last but not least, let's move to, to Asia. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to invite Taisir Barakat from United Arab, Arab Emirates. Taisir, over to you, please. Hi, thank you. I, I'd like to start by echoing what everyone else has said and thanking you for that illuminating presentation. It was incredibly interesting, gave a lot to think about. And for me, I think the main takeaway has been all of the problems you've outlined that are brought about by the implementation of Pillar 2, the seemingly endless scope for disputes, not, not limited in any, in any way, shape or form, as well as all the issues that, that come about when you try to resolve these disputes. And when you combine that with the initial discussion that you, that you had at the start as to why Pillar 2 was even implemented in the first place, what, what possible reasoning there was behind it. I think the, the image that you were painting is that there isn't such a strong justification, especially not with all of the issues that are brought about. So I think that this is the sticking point that, is, that has come about for me. What really ultimately was the reasoning behind it? And at this point in time, with all of these issues that have been illustrated, do you think that, it, that we should continue to pursue this, this objective? Is it, was it a good decision? Should we continue pushing for it? And perhaps maybe the reasons that the reasons that effective dispute resolution mechanisms aren't in place is simply that there is no proper understanding of what's go, oh, what we're striving towards. And there's no real commitment by a lot of countries to, to pillar two. So I, I was wondering what your thoughts might be on that. Thank you very much for that, Taisir. And before uh, giving the floor to you, giving back to you, Hans, let me offer some, some thoughts I have regarding your uh, really important questions. So regarding the first one, why doesn't Pillar 2 provide for any instrument for dispute resolution or dispute prevention? I think one potential response to that is that China and India are simply unhappy with, with tax arbitration or, or similar methods and the i mean g20 given the lack of consensus from the from india and china um, is experimenting with, with this uh, with with this strategy of not saying anything regarding on how to to solve disputes so it's a very pragmatic thing um probably it is based on what the g20 has learned from pillar one where this question is fully answered since Pillar 1 is arguably collapsing, the G20 is trying to somehow experiment with a different strategy in Pillar 2, simply but say nothing on, on this uh, topic, uh, with the expectation that if China and India accept Pillar 2 as it stands now, um, we will be heading to a chaotic world with a, a large volume of disputes, and so China and India will be forced somehow to accept mediation or arbitration uh, later down the line. So that would be uh, my, my response to, to question one. And um, a response uh, compatible with, with that insight 
um, I think I, I would offer similar responses to the remaining um, uh, fundamental questions. So um, Hans, over to you to, we would like to, to hear your reactions to all these comments. Thank you. <laughs> yes, if I can still remember that. No, I think <laughs> if, 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 let's say starting with, let's say the political picture, and so I think I, I was in, I, uh, in January, I was in Washington, DC uh, to speak on similar issues at the DC bar conference where there was a lot of attendance from US treasury and IRS people, very of the highest ranks. And I think that the sort of general command they gave was US will do anything to make pillar one a failure. It doesn't want pillar one, right? And um, uh, <laughs> I mean, the current standstill on movement on both pillars actually is a sort of success in the US view. Now, I mean, when it comes to pillar two, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, the US, for internal political reasons, could never, let's say, um, uh, ratify any MLC, right? So the best, I think, and what the what the what the what the US can do is to adjust its guilty rules, its domestic minimum tax rules, according to Pillar Two. To make it in conformity with Pena 2, and thereby, let's say, practically join Pena 2. What other countries will do if Pena 1 would fail? I don't know. I find it quite suspicious. I think in Pena 1 is extremely important to India and also to Europe, right? And what I heard from certain European governments that they argue, well, if Pillar 1 is going to fail, we're going to have to withdraw our support for Pillar 2, right? We can implement it still under European directive, but that would be a purely European initiative, but not an OECD initiative. Um, what the position of India would be we don't know. I think there's a lot we don't know. I think you, the Indians always, let's say, make sure that <laughs> they are sort of vague, remain vague when it comes to deciding. China has been much clearer. It was always opposed against Pillar 2, exactly for the reason mentioned that it's a breach of tax sovereignty of India, of China, but I think of countries generally. However, China is in support of arbitration. It has no problem with arbitration. Actually, it's pursuing arbitration in its Belt and Road Initiative. But then the arbitration, of course, is there to protect the interest of Chinese companies. It's, it's a very unilateral interest. Um, India, indeed, traditionally is opposed against binding arbitration. But I think also India seems to be shifting its position. If you look at, let's say, those um, uh, determination panels as proposed under Pillar 1, India, uh, as proposed under Pillar 1, India is not opposed to that anymore, right? The Indian reservations are more about how those panels should operate practically, in particular composition, India wants them to be composed solely of authorities with no independent third experts aboard. The United States, for instance, has a preference to make all the experts independent third people. <laughs> and Europe is in between, sort of mix of authorities and independents. I think that is more, let's say, the, 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 the debate under um, uh, uh, Pillar 1, the uh, determination panel. 
they don't call it arbitration. They call it mandatory binding dispute resolution, but actually it is arbitration. <laughs> Only the word is banned. Um, it's very un insecure what will happen with, uh, with both pillars, with either pillars. I think the, the very fact that the OECD is postponing and postponing a final solution I think it's a sort of clear indication that it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve um, uh, agreement of some kind of another among countries. I mean, the, the positions, but also, let's say, the capacities of countries to implement these kind of things very so tremendously. So that is definitely a point. I th for me, it's not the issue is not whether I like Pillar one or pillar two. I think for me, <laughs> what matters is there is so much difference in views and 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 different well capacities to adopt these kind of things domestically. That well, well, I, I wouldn't bet on success for either pillar one or pillar two. Um, nonetheless, I think there is there are some interesting elements in it. In Europe, for instance, they are now heading for a one um, uh, synthesized European company law. I think there a system of minimum tax rates would fit in and would be easily to enforce. At global scale, we don't have a single global corporate tax, <laughs> that's utopia. So, I mean, that is very difficult to, uh, to, to, to make all countries move in the same direction. Um, another interesting element is indeed, let's say, these, these, these review and determination panels on the panel one, in particular, the review panels. And, and you may remember my plea for an easy early coordination mechanism. This, this, so I see some valuable elements in, in the pillar. So even if the two pillars as such would fail, there might still be, let's say, certain elements um, valuable enough to um, further explore at the OECD or at the UN or at regional level of, or even, let's say, um, for countries bilaterally. Um, so Good. this is for the political um, uh, issues. Um, I think there, there was also a very particular um, uh, question about arbitration and, uh, and confidentiality. And that has been, I think, thought through um, uh, by the OECD, uh, among others. And if you look at the commentary on the... Um, uh, uh, the the um, uh, draft that the OECD commentary is comprised, let's say, for the operation of arbitration, you see comment that publication does not necessarily mean precedential value, right? And um, I think by nature, a map resolution stands on its own. It applies only for that particular case at stake. And I think that's what the OECD made to reason, well, you may publish, but you still don't create any precedential value. No country, no authorities are bound to do exactly the same thing in an exactly same situation, right? That being said, and, and if you have, let's say, <laughs> various arbitrations, Arbitrators are probably keen on looking at what decisions past arbitrators um, uh, decided in a identical or a similar case, right? That's what we see happening also these days with domestic courts. I think there are even entire databases available from which domestic courts 
can um, identify similar cases and can draw, let's say, um, inspiration of how to deal, let's say, with a particular case and the, and the inclination to come up with, say, with an internationally compatible solution is only growing with domestic courts. So while publication would not create, formally create, presidential value, my question would be what's wrong in taking notice of prior decisions and adjusting to that, to the extent possible. I don't see there's anything wrong. Also from the perspective of authorities, what would you want to do if you have a situation, an issue which keeps recurring and recurring? Would you go uh, engage in, in maps every single time? I think we know that some authorities actually agree map solutions applicable to recurrent situations for reason of efficiency. They're already doing it, right? So I don't see anything wrong with it. While it may, from a formal point of view, not be I mean, binding, but it can it can be helpful. Hans, can you hear me? Yes. We we have to to conclude um, this meeting within the next few minutes. I just wanted to to thank you for your quite illuminating presentation. I think one main lesson I'm learning from your presentation is that both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 are assuming a level of cooperation from countries that it's simply not there. So the big question is how the world of international taxation may look like if both pillars fail. And probably we, we should devote an entire new seminar with your participation in order to, <laughs> to answer that, that very, very question. The format of, of this um, seminar is unprecedented because of the existence of this um, panel of discussants who are LLM students. So I would like to take a picture of, of, of all of us, if that is possible. So may I ask you, Hans, if you could uh, take your presentation out and to take a, a picture of this historic seminar? I could say, uh, Vicente, Maria, Ian, Amanda, Sina, Nicolas, could you please turn your Camera on, if that is possible. Good. Ready? Steady. Nicolas, we are, Nicolas, are you there? Sina, Amanda? Ready? Steady? Go. Go. We are all here now. Excellent. Uh, hands. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Hans Moik, Chairs of Tribute Organization, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, very illuminating, and we are looking forward to your next presentation at the LSE Taxation Seminars. Thank you very much. Happy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye, Hans. Thank you. Thanks. See you. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Thank you. Hans, okay. <laughs>